So if you enjoy Shark Tank as much as I do, you've probably noticed that Mr. Wonderful is one of the most outspoken investors, but that doesn't always necessarily translate into results. Today, we're gonna dive into his track record and I'm gonna show you exactly why being a tough negotiator may sometimes work against our very own Mr. Wonderful. Just like my other videos where I've done a deep dive on each of the sharks and their track record, I'm gonna start this one off with some quick stats. So right off the bat, Kevin O'Leary has made 39 investments. Of those, 21 are still in operation uh, with 17 that based on my best guess have gone under. So, you know, roughly 56% of his investment is still alive and chomping, uh, which is, you know, pretty much right in line with the other sharks for the most part. Uh, he's had four exits to date. And you know he's actually done done really well on some of his investments. So some of his top investments include uh, GrooveBook, where you know he was able to buy a significant portion of that business, which was then later acquired by Shutterfly. Uh, I'm estimating he gained probably about a 77x in, on his investment, or roughly 5.8 million dollars. He did that deal right alongside Mark Cuban, and so to the two of them, even though the company was only acquired for like 15 million bucks they took out like two thirds of the returns, which, you know, it feels like a lot, you know, especially given that the entrepreneur put in their like blood, sweat and tears into the business. But on the flip side, the entrepreneur walked away with like $5 million. So, you know, it's not like they're doing too bad. Another one of his successful investments is a company called Jump Forward, which was uh, an app that helped communication between athletes and colleges and coaches and so forth. That ultimately ended up getting acquired by a company called Active uh, that does a lot of things around sports and events. He was able to turn that $300,000 investment into what I'm estimating to be about $7 million or about a 24X return. And then the last one that I thought was interesting is the only one to invest about 200 grand into a company called Total Merchant Solutions. That company was ultimately acquired and based on the information I was able to gather, my best guess is he took that 200 grand and turned it into about $5 million. Now, as you'll notice, if you watched any of my other Shark Tank videos where I do a deep dive on the sharks, uh, all three of those investments, his top performing investments, all generated cash. Like, they're not just valued at that high number, they actually sold uh, for a pretty meaningful amount of money. Uh, two of them are, albeit my estimates on what he made, but uh, based on the information I could find, those two companies were actually doing, seemed to be doing pretty well. And so I'd be surprised if he, he didn't actually end up generating a pretty good return. That said, I don't have any, you know, special knowledge about the case. Um, but nonetheless, you know, look, doing, getting a 24, 25 X return and upwards of a 77 X return on your investment, it's pretty good. Especially because Mr. Wonderful tends to write larger checks uh, than, the, uh, than his peers. His average check is about $100,000. On some of these where he's done really well, he's written larger checks, you know, 200 grand, 300 grand in the cases of, of Jump and, and Total Merchant. That's really helped drive a lot of his returns. If you look at the rest of his investments, there's like one or two other ones that have seen an increase in valuation. For the most part, a lot of his companies have either gone under, you know, about 17 of the, the 39. Uh, four of them have gone up in valuation and or been acquired. Uh, so, you know, there's still a lot sitting there in the portfolio that's TBD. We'll see if it ends up getting acquired, or going public, probably not go public. I didn't see anything in his portfolio that led me to believe that, that he's got one of those in there. Uh, but you know, there's probably some some more that will, will end up getting acquired because they're generating revenue, growing, doing well enough. In addition to writing an average check of about $100,000, uh, his highest check he's ever written was $2.5 million, which for a long time was the largest check and the largest deal on Shark Tank. Uh, his peer, Robert, ended up beating him out on that not too long after that. Um, and then his lowest, let's see, his lowest check is about 25K. So, uh, you know, that's a pretty big delta of almost two and a half million dollars between his largest and smallest check. But, you know, I think, you know, looking at his deals, it's mostly around the 100K mark, which is about what you should suspect. The other thing that's interesting about Mr. Wonderful is that he, I think he's kind of a deal junkie. And so he's always looking for like creative deals. He's done more like royalty or licensing or whatever deals than any of his peers. 
He's done about four of those. And frankly, he's done really well at them, which makes sense why he would do them. He's invested about $153,000 in those and generated about $2.4 million in licensing revenue. Um, you know, it's interesting. So in venture, there is this concept called RBF or revenue-based financing, which works very much like a royalty. So essentially what an investor does is they come in and they say, oh yeah, you need a million dollars. Okay, I'll give you a million dollars, but then I want 10% of all of your revenues going forward until you pay me back $2 million, whatever it might be. Um, and these these models can be really effective because Unlike a loan where you're going to get paid back a certain amount every month, regardless of how revenue and how the business is performing, in this case, you know, it can kind of move up and down with the revenue. So if you have a business that's super seasonal and it's really hard for you to make a consistent debt payment, well, RBF can be a really interesting solution to help you solve that problem. Uh, and then compared to equity, it's nice because you're not giving up control of your business. You're not giving up equity in your business, which honestly can be one of the most expensive forms of capital is selling equity. And so these models end up being pretty interesting. They also create really good alignment in the case of Kevin O'Leary because, you know, he's got this brand, he's got connections and so forth. And so now he's incentivized to push sales right now. If he was an equity owner, he would still be incentivized. But in this case, because he's actually taking a portion of revenues, he's even more incentivized to really drive that top line revenue growth, uh, which is different. Like if you're an equity owner, you wanna see top line growth, but you really wanna see like bottom line growth. You wanna see like profits, right? Cause that's how you make your money is based on the profits. And in his case, he's like, doesn't care he's about profits. He's just like, let's just grow this thing really big which can be good and bad, right? If you're the equity owner and he's sitting there saying, push, push, push on revenue at all costs, that may not always be the best uh, thing for your business and for you. Uh, but nonetheless, like it does create this really interesting incentive uh, paradigm for him. And he does it well, like he's done very well uh, with this. In fact, arguably, he's since he's generated like almost a 16X on those investments, maybe he should just stick to that because it's a lot better than his overall investments across his entire portfolio. Let's talk about those. So to date, he's invested $7.5 million, which is right in the middle of the other sharks. Uh, I think Mark Cuban's invested a little bit more. Robert has definitely invested more. So, you know, it's, it's up there, but it's still more than Barbara and Damon. Based on my calculations, he's been able to turn that $7.5 million into $34.6 million, resulting in a 4.6x return on his invested dollars, which is pretty good, but that's not, you know, including all of the facts here. So 4.6, if you watch my other videos, you know, is not as good, definitely not as good as Damon. He is by far the best. And if you haven't watched that video, when you're done watching this one, go check that one out. Uh, but it's not as good as even as Barbara and or Mark Cuban. He's certainly not the worst, but definitely not the best investor. And when you consider that he is the least prolific, or in other words, he writes the fewest checks of all the other investors, you know, it kind of makes it even less impressive in my opinion. The other thing to keep in mind is that he's lost over 50% of the capital he's invested. In fact, of the capital he's lost, 66% of that was lost in one single deal. Yep, that $2.5 million deal that he invested in, yeah, he lost basically all of it. That was a company called Zips, uh, which was a portable wine product that came in a beautiful looking plastic wine glass uh, for single serve wine that you could take to sporting events and you know, other other activities, outdoor events, whatever it might be. And he was like so bullish on this that he wrote this $2.5 million check all by himself. Company never really went anywhere. At most generated about a million dollars and a half in revenue. I can't really imagine that they were profitable at all at that amount. So yeah, kind of a tough deal to take that big of a zero. I mean, basically a third of his invested capital uh, total write-off in one deal. And that brings me to this idea of portfolio construction. So if we were to look at Mr. Wonderful Capital Partners, uh, as though Kevin O'Leary was a fund in of himself making these investments, 
then you'd really want to ask yourself, how is he going about constructing his portfolio? Because it ends up being a super important question. If I were an LP looking at his fund, my biggest concern would be the fact that he invested a third of his total invested capital into one deal. Now, in the big scheme of things, he's worth roughly $400 million, and these investments only represent, you know, less than 2% of his total net worth. So not like a huge gamble from that perspective on a total basis, but if you look at it as though it were a fund and he had a $7.5 million fund and he plowed 2.5 million of it into one deal and lost it, I would be really concerned. In fact, even if he put $2.5 million into one deal and didn't lose it, I would be concerned because that just feels like a lot of risk. For the most part, you want to have, you want to be really clear as a venture investor about what your strategy is and stick to it. And different strategies can be effective. You've got some angels that are spray and pray. They write a relatively small check into a lot of deals and they have a lot of discipline not to write big checks when they get overly excited. I think if you look at Barbara and Damon's portfolios, that's a good example of that where the biggest check they ever write is 350 or 500 grand respectively. On the other hand, you could have a more concentrated portfolio. So maybe you say, hey, I'm only gonna make you know, 15 investments instead of 50 investments like Barbara and Damon. In that case, you're taking very concentrated bets and you're gonna have to be super involved. And I've seen that strategy play out as well. The problem with Mr. Wonderful is he's doing a little bit of everything. He's investing these big checks of $2.5 million into like just a couple deals and I don't know how involved he really is on those. And then he's also writing lots of little checks hoping one of them pans out. Uh, and frankly, that, that can be a really, really tough strategy. See, the other thing that I think is interesting about Mr. Wonderful is the number of deals he's done because it feels like he throws in an offer on every single company that pitches on Shark Tank. Rarely is he the first one to bow out. And even when he does bow out, sometimes he comes back in. He's also like the most likely to partner with other people. 64% of his deals, he's partnered with them. And when you take those two things into consideration, that 64% of his deals, he's done it with a partner, and the fact that he's done the fewest number of deals than his peers by like 10 deals. So like a lot, like he's done, you know, 80% of what the other sharks have done. I really think it speaks to his investment strategy where he's really aggressive with entrepreneurs. I mean, his name, Mr. Wonderful, is kind of tongue in cheek, right? It's a joke on like how unwonderful he really is when in the negotiating process. And I think it really turns away a lot of entrepreneurs. I think it's a really important lesson for those of you that are aspiring venture capitalists in that venture investing is kind of like dating and whoever's the most attractive gets the deal done. So look, if you know, the entrepreneur is absolutely crushing it and being super successful, then it makes sense to try to be nice to them and cater to them and be helpful. But it also matters being nice to the entrepreneurs that aren't doing as well because that story gets around. And you don't wanna be known as the jerk uh, to entrepreneurs. You wanna be known as the super helpful, thoughtful, considerate, you know, easy killed, investor that they want to work with, that's gonna be there with them through you know, the good times and the bad times. That's how you end up winning the really good deals, is by building a great reputation. And so I think it's interesting that despite throwing out the most number of offers, he's able to close the fewest number of deals, and, and the deals he does close, two thirds of the time, he's doing them with somebody else. He needs someone else to prop up his reputation in order to get a deal done. Now, all of that said, it makes it sound like I think Mr. Wonderful is a bad investor. And here's why he's actually probably the best investor of all of them. And that is because he actually generates cash returns. So if we look at all the other investors, most of the other sharks returns are paper gains, which means on paper, the company is doing really well and the valuation has gone up but they haven't actually generated cash on those investments yet. Uh, now, hopefully those companies continue to do well and they get acquired or they go public and they end up generating great cash returns. But for the most part, those are TBD. 
In the case of Kevin O'Leary, he's actually returned $20 million on his investments, which is way more than his peers. In fact, if you look at this metric called DPI, which is distributions paid in, which is simply a measure of if ever, of every dollar that I've given an investor to invest or that Kevin O'Leary has invested, how many dollars has he given me back in cash? Not just like paper gains, but actual cash in my pocket. He's returned $2.70, which is much better. It's like 10 times what some of the other sharks have returned in cash to their own wallets. Uh, or to their hypothetical investors, you know, if you were to invest in their funds. And so on the one hand, you know, being a tough negotiator maybe costs him some really interesting deals. On the other hand, he's actually been able to perform well and actually been able to generate real cash returns, which let's be honest, like you can't eat paper gains. You can only eat cash gains, right? Those are the only ones at the end of the day that really even matter. And so even though his like total returns are maybe not the best, he has been the best at actually generating real cash in his pocket. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out my other one on Mark Cuban where I do the same breakdown and analyze his track record and his investment approach as a shark tank. If you enjoyed this, be sure to check out my other video with Damon and learn why he is one of the best and worst investors among the sharks. Thanks.